Hey, cockface. When's the next SpongeBob coming out? Uh, damn it, Stoutmeister. How'd you get my number? That's the least of your worries, dead monkey. But anyways, you do realize it's been over a year since you did your second part for your series, right? What's taking so long in the third part? Wait a second. It's been a year? Holy shit, that must have been some strong-ass orange juice and... What the fuck happened to my hair and poorly trimmed beard? Oh, wait a minute, there's a note right here. Dear Monkey, I borrowed about half of your hair and beard so I wouldn't get cold in the winter. I also gave that stout Meister Meister Burger fellow your phone number in exchange for a shot of fireball whiskey and a vigorous blowjob. God damn it, what happened to client confidentiality? I also borrowed your Xbox. Long story short, it doesn't work anymore. I left it on your pillow. Love, Bandit. P.S. You should probably think twice before opening your vegetable crisper in your refrigerator. God damn it. Stout, this is the kind of shit that I have to put up with on a regular basis. Oh, and uh, by the way, you should probably get yourself checked out. With that in mind, I have been wondering why my balls have been chafing. I mean, weird feeling down here. Uh, but anyways, dude, I think it's time you got onto that series. I mean, we all know how YouTube relevancy works. I mean, at this rate, you're going to be done with this series by 2020. Gee, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm pretty sure people have already forgotten about it by now. <laughs> it's not like... Have you forgotten that you're my whipping boy, dead monkey? Um, yes, I am, Stout, but... Because you wouldn't want any more permanent marks on that hairy ass of yours, would you, Mr. Monkey? Uh, no, Stout, but... Then what do you say about making that video for me, Whipping Boy? I I'm ready. Good. Now turn on that camera and start flapping your gums, caveman. Oh, uh, okay, Stout. Whatever you say. We just calm down. Oh, and by the way, when are we going to review that Smosh movie? When blueberries fly out of my nipples! <sighs> oh, damn it, who's calling me now? Hello? <sighs> damn it, Atticus, I'll make the fucking video already! Just leave me alone! God! Damn, I need to go and change my clothes. <sighs> Feels good to be in front of a camera again. Anyways, welcome to the long-awaited part three of my SpongeBob character analysis series. Daddy's back, my bitches! Oh boy, another year, another 40 minute clusterfuck. Seriously though, I have to thoroughly apologize to those who have been patiently waiting for this next part. As much as I'd like to convince myself that I'm the mysterious Mr. Enter, that simply isn't the case. I mean, Viacom would probably love to put my channel through the ringer again, and they'll probably do the same thing here because the monkeys who work in their legal department don't know anything about fair use. Tug Walker, can I get a witness here? Hell, I actually wasn't sure if people were still interested in the series during my hiatus from it. But I've recently been getting loads of comments asking when the next one is coming out, and it warms my heart to see that I managed to entertain you a lot with my brand of awkward, cynical humor, which I have to thank you guys for being so awesome and supportive. Though, like I mentioned in my update video that I made about the status of the series, I'm only treating this as a side project, so if you're anticipating this to be an extended series of videos like what Pie Guy has going on, I regret to inform you that that isn't the case either. But anyways, that's enough semantics. Let's talk about the current show for a bit. So where has the show really gone within the past few years as a series? Besides a second movie which I haven't seen yet, and a few new episodes with the series creator involved, not much seems to be going on. Oh yeah, I almost forgot, they also made a musical. God, you know the executives of a kids network are desperate when they turn their cartoon properties into a fucking musical. Just look what happened to Shrek. It truly is all ogre now. But anyways, as it is common knowledge that Spongebob is to Nickelodeon like Corey Taylor is to Loudwire, the network doesn't seem 
like it's completely dying out. In fact, it seems to be moving on fine with some more of those dank new Dan Schneider sitcoms and some cartoons about talking birds. And at least all the butt jokes are still intact. Kids love them butt jokes. And at least we're getting both a Hey Arnold movie and a Rock of His Modern Life movie. So it's not like the network is completely up in flames, right? Shit, remember at the beginning of my first part where I mentioned that you couldn't go into your local Walmart without seeing that little yellow bastard wherever you go? Well, it seems they've been replaced by another brand of little yellow bastards. And they're 200 times more cancerous. SpongeBob may be fading from the limelight, but who says we can't poke a few more holes into this rotty yellow horse carcass, am I right? So with that said, let's keep this gravy train rolling. Today we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite squirrel next to Stuart Little and Foamy, our lord and master, Sandy Cheeks. <laughs> When I think of Sandy Cheeks, I have to wonder what kind of narcotics some of these writers must have been smoking to come up with a bipedal Texan squirrel who lives underwater, wears a space slash deep sea diving suit, loves karate, speaks Italian, and plays the guitar. Then again, we're talking about the same writers who came up with a talking fry cook sponge with a pet snail and an obsession with bubbles. But on the flip side, Sandy is probably one of the most underrated characters in the main cast. As a marine biologist, or inventor, or botanist, or rocket technician, I honestly don't fucking know anymore. As a scientist, uh, okay, let's just go with that. She's very ambitious about the things that pique her interest and will do whatever it takes to pursue her passions. Yet, she isn't one to shy away from having fun with her friends every once in a while. She's very competitive in a friendly way, and she often competes with SpongeBob, her best friend, in various activities like karate and looking for strands of hay and needle stacks. Though sometimes she has a tendency to become a bit too competitive and her passions sometimes get in the way of her companionships, she's always remained remain loyal and true with her comrades and will go out of her way to help them when they need her. So what's become of her character over the years? Honestly, for the longest time, I couldn't put my finger on it. I've yet to see her act as purposefully ignorant or really as malicious as some of the other main characters, and she's always remained fairly consistently intact with her original personality. Although after watching a few post-season 5 episodes where she's played a major role, I've noticed a few things here and there. For one, she seems to be much more interested in her scientific work than she used to be. That might not sound like a problem, but at times, it's as if her obsession with science goes a bit too far. When she becomes really passionate about something, it practically blinds her at the expense of her friends. And they always seem to get harmed or placed in some kind of peril when she goes overboard. This has always sort of been a trait of hers from past episodes. But she seems more accustomed to using her friends to pursue these passions rather than her friends getting caught in the middle of them through participation in her best interest. Now in some episodes, she uses what she once considered her best friends as lab mice for her experiment often disregarding their safety for the sake of attaining her desired results. It's come to the point where it seems like Sandy enjoys pitting her best friends against each other for the sake of her own research, and it appears that she's been doing this kind of behavior in more recent episodes. The first episode that we're reviewing today comes from Season 9, and that episode would be The Fish Bowl. So, without further ado, let us commence the review! The episode begins with a mysterious package slumping down by Sandy's front door. My newest science book has arrived! Oh hey! It's them fancy bloomers I ordered too! This day just keeps getting better! Oh perfect! Literature and underwear. And judging by your spontaneous arousal, I'm kind of afraid to find out what kind of specimen you're studying, you dirty, dirty squirrel. So it turns out that the book in question is about the study of behavioral psychology, and after reading a few sentences, she decides to go and observe and record people on public transport transportation for the purpose of research. And from my experiences with public transportation, she's probably gonna find a lot of tweakers, juggalos, old people, and just poor hygiene. Most likely a combination of the four. Older, lumpy-looking female subject. Obviously a mother. Hates daughter. Excuse me. Subject asked to be excused, but I am unable to observe what she wishes to be excused from. Take a hike, mammal. Subject's emotional state seems to be rising in anger. Eyebrows are now considerably furrowed. <laughs> Gee, Sandy, maybe you would have had better luck if you were to grab their tail fins in a provocative manner and claim it was part of a social experiment. Maybe call yourself Sand Pepper and open up a Patreon. Also, gotta love that underwater racism with the mammal comment. So Sandy conveniently finds SpongeBob and Patrick running around like the nincompoops they are and approaches them to ask in a rather nonchalant manner if she could observe them quote-unquote acting natural. And as she sticks her microphone in their faces, they both seize up like they just got some gnarly butt cramps or they drop their doubloons in the shower. Which, of course, when she takes away the microphone, this happens. 
Oh my god, will you shut your half-wit pie holes already? She realizes that if she wants to attain her desired results, she's gonna have to record them acting natural without them knowing about it. Even though I'm pretty sure she already observes them acting natural on a semi-regular basis, considering they've been best friends since the first season, pretty much. I mean, I can sort of understand if she's doing it because she has a solid prediction and hypothesis of what her results might be, but as a scientist, doesn't that seem like an easy way out? Because from my experiences in science classes, okay, there ain't no easy way out in science class, but isn't the fascination of the unknown one of the main reasons? and scientists join their fields? Hell, she'd probably be better off putting up an ad on Craigslist and see how many desperate people would want to make a quick dollar. Can you hook us up to electrodes or, or expose us to gamma rays? Jesus, I know SpongeBob became an ignorant sociopath over the years, but I didn't think he'd get all S&M up in this bitch. Has he been hanging out with Mel Gibson or something? Fill one bucket with white sand and one bucket with black sand. Easy sneezy. <laughs> Okay, what the hell is up with all these visual gags where their brains keep popping out? I swear, I've seen this kind of gag being used over and over again throughout the series, and it was kind of funny at first, but now it's become rather annoying. Like, we get it already. They're supposed to be stupid. So once Dingle and Barry leave to scout out their buckets of sand, Sandy begins wiring the entire pineapple with cameras and microphones. God, to think she's a marine biologist, an inventor, a clam wrestler, a psychologist, and now a voyeurist. I mean, there's more cameras in SpongeBob's living room than on the set of Hell's Kitchen, and a lot less profanity and fabrication. Anyways, once they get back, she orders them to count each individual sand grain and see which bucket holds more sand. And of course, they're completely oblivious to all the expensive recording equipment and collateral damage. Oh, and to add a little conflict, Sandy tells Patrick that he's in charge. Oh, and Patrick, you're in charge. Seriously, what did I just fucking say here? After a few bland shenanigans involving sand counting, it then cuts to Sandy imitating a stereotypical ice cream peddler in a mobile TV station disguised as an ice cream truck, putting the same amount of ice cream in two bowls of different sizes to give to Sponge and Pat, and proceeds to observe them from her truck. How'd you like a nice, a free, a bowl of tootsie fruitsy ice cream? Okay, one, this whole thing is just a red flag in itself. And two, I'm pretty sure even Mario would find her fake Italian accent offensive. Mom! And you know, we're only halfway through the episode and the premise seems a little familiar. Again, I have to ask, why is Sandy doing this to her best friends? It does seem pretty out of character of Sandy to be using her friends as test subjects, pitting them against each other for the sake of experiment and amusement. Hell, this isn't even the first time she's done it. In previous episodes such as To Save a Squirrel and House Sitting for Sandy, SpongeBob and Patrick are completely oblivious to the fact that Sandy put them in compromising, if not completely contrived, predicaments for the sake of studying them. The main difference between this episode and those those episodes are that Sandy straight up asks Spongebob and Patrick to participate in this one, and a good portion of this episode revolves around some of the hijinks that Sandy goes through in order to achieve her desired results. Whereas the others revolve around Spongebob and Patrick fucking things up and having Sandy reveal that she was testing them at the end. Like, I can kind of appreciate they're trying to do something a little different here with the scenario, but it still seems like an idea that's been sort of rehashed from past episodes. You got more ice cream! Patrick, I think your ice cream only looks smaller because the bowl is big. There's only one fair thing to do. What's that? Patrick, you call that fair? Oh. I'm in charge! You know, I've been having a lot of people ask me to make Patrick the next segment in the series. Honestly, I'd rather leave him for later, just to showcase as many examples as I can before I roast this pink asshole. Believe me, it'll be all the more satisfying. Anyway, so Sandy initiates phase two by supplying the two Nimrods with ice cream cones. And as you guessed it, Patrick starts acting like a twat again. This time he starts licking SpongeBob's depleting ice cream cone, forces him to rub his feet, and makes more smug, condescending remarks. Like, I get that the power's supposed to be getting to his head, but this has pretty much become the norm for him. I mean, is this half of the episode supposed to be a little commentary on what happens when you give idiots too much power? Because there's a joke that I'm trying desperately not to use about this year's political candidates. Also, how the hell is SpongeBob's ice cream melting so quickly while Patrick's is still perfectly intact? I don't I remember seeing Sandy sabotaging SpongeBob's cone or anything. Anyway, shit finally hits the fan when Patrick kicks over the bucket of black sand and mixing it with the white sand. Seriously, he makes me want to punch my monitor sometimes. And the two inevitably end up in a scrap with each other. Would you like sprinkles on it? Jeepers, I didn't see that coming. Are you fucking kidding me? 
I don't even need to say it, right? Eh, screw it. Let me just sum the rest of it up. <gasps> and the episode ends with Sandy bursting into the pineapple to stop Spongebob and Patrick from killing each other. She reveals to them that she rigged the entire pineapple. The two of them forgive each other. Sandy gives them ice cream. Ziltoid wins the 2016 election with his running mate Fred Durst and the world keeps spinning. <sighs> Well, that was my cat Icarus moment. Overall, it's not a very eventful episode. In fact, it could have been much worse, but surprisingly, not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. In all honesty, this episode was decently written compared to past seasons. Despite the premise sort of treading old ground, the humor and the dialogue are not too bad here. There's a handful of jokes that are actually well-timed and sort of akin to the original show. In fact, there's a reoccurring joke throughout the episode where Squidward continuously tries to attain free ice cream, and I don't want to dive too deep into it because it's actually pretty damn funny, and y'all should see it for yourselves. Even if there are some gags, such as the brain popping and other predictable cliches that have already been used time and time again, there are some jokes that sort of compensate for them. Sandy in particular isn't as bad as she could have been, but at the same time, she still seems relatively out of character. She's willing to take advantage of her friend's declining IQs just so she can jot down the outcome for her own amusement and curiosity. While she doesn't seem to hold any real malicious intent besides being led by her obsession with science, it still seems pretty out of character of her to be using her friends like this. And of course, we have Patrick acting way too mean-spirited, as usual, for pretty much no discernible reason besides the fact that he's stupid and apparently has some kind of bipolar disorder from what I can tell. Like, around the end of the episode when Sandy reveals everything, Patrick starts crying out of nowhere as if he actually feels some kind of remorse for being a pompous dick. That seems out of character considering all the changes Patrick has gone through over the years. Now for the record, I actually think it's fine that there's at least some kind of mean-spiritedness in a cartoon, whether it's a kid's cartoon or an adult one. Not everything has to be sunshine and rainbows, even in a kid's cartoon. Though I think mean-spiritedness becomes a problem when a character acts completely out of character too often without rhyme or reason, the character ultimately learns nothing from being out of character, or when there's too much emphasis on the general mean-spiritedness. One crucial aspect of comedy is misery. In theory, someone has to suffer, and what makes the suffering funny is when the right amount of exaggeration is implemented. If it's not exaggerated properly, either you won't get the laugh, or people will get their intestines in a knot and blast you on social media. And of course, that's only one component, and I went a little bit off track there. In closing, it's not a terrible episode, but it's not anything that really stands out. It's worth noting that the series creator Stefan Hellenberg has an executive producer's credit in the beginning title, which maybe he had a little bit of say in terms of quality control. Either way, if they could continue to focus on the writing in future episodes like this, maybe we can see some good out of the rest of the series till the end. Or at least till the third movie comes out. By the way, there's a third movie in the makes, and the gravy train just won't stop rolling. One review down, two more to go. Now, one thing you'll notice with these next couple of episodes is that... Oh, wait a minute, somebody's calling me. I wonder who it could be. Hello? Hey, you big hairy beast of a man. When's the next Spongebob video coming out? Oh, hey, Shades. I just finished the first review right now. Share any good BuzzFeed articles recently? Oh, ha ha. Very funny. I actually found one that's titled 12 Ways to Pander to the 90s Demographic. One of the sections said, make a 40 minute long Spongebob video on YouTube. Oh, that's rich. I'm pretty sure they also have an article called Five Good Reasons Why Wearing Sunglasses Indoors is Impractical When You're Not Clinically Blind or high on something. Okay, that one actually hurt a little. Nah, but seriously, bro, I gotta get back to the review. And, uh, by the way, don't tell me when I said this, but... You know Skull Ripper? Yeah, I think he has a real stinky problem. And by stinky problem, I mean he stinks. Oh. Well, okie dokie, swag and smokey, I hope the rest of your video goes great Wait and... Wait a second. Where did you hear that phrase from? Uh, never mind, gotta go. Huh. Well, that was strange. Anyways, in this next episode, Sandy doesn't observe her friends acting natural or dressing up as an ice cream peddler. Instead, she becomes a victim of identity theft. With that said, semi-fresh from season seven, someone's in the kitchen with Sandy. Someone's in the kitchen, I know. Oh. The episode begins with SpongeBob sniffing some fresh buns. <laughs> 
Nah, I'm just kidding. The episode actually begins with Plankton once again attempting to steal the Krabby Patty secret formula, this time via hamburger bun. And since Plankton is stupid and doesn't actually think his plans through, instead of exiting the bun from whence he came from, having Karen create a diversion in the common area loud enough for Mr. Krabs to leave his office, slipping into Mr. Krabs' office, stealing the formula, and vacating the premises, he waits till SpongeBob makes a sandwich out of the bun and hand delivers it to the patron, who happens to be Sandy. Because squirrels eat underwater cheeseburgers, right? But before I continue... Uh, again, what the fuck was Plankton thinking with this plan? I swear, it's as if the rioters are making his plans convoluted and bound for failure for the sake of conveniently cheap plot points. Oh yeah, that's right, because they are making his plans convoluted and bound for failure for the sake of conveniently cheap plot points. Whoa! Well, this is perfect. Remember what I said in my Curse of Chucky review about close-ups of people eating? And people try to tell me that The Splinter is one of the most disgusting episodes of the series. So, Plankton passes out and reawakens in Sandy's shower later on, where he discovers that Sandy's fur is unzippable and detachable. And that she wears two bikinis? Okay, I get that this is supposed to be some sort of form of censorship because it's a kid's show, but even by cartoon logic, this is weird. Also, I can't help but mention the partially uncanniness of how her fur pelt looks without her in it. Seriously, this is some Texas Chainsaw Massacre shit. Oh, and would this mean that SpongeBob and Patrick are ripping off portions of Sandy's fur pelt in survival of the idiots? Because I assume that her hair grew back in... <sighs> Screw this, I'm looking way too deeply into this. So Plankton hatches another half-assed plan to steal the formula by stealing Sandy's fur pelt and locking Sandy in the shower. What in tarnation? Maybe I left it outside. <laughs> Some low-life varmint stole my things and broke into my home. My yeah, it seems a bit counterintuitive to have the lock on your bathroom door to be outside of the bathroom. She might be a scientist, but she sure as hell ain't no architect or interior designer. Oh, and I'll give the writers a few points for that coffee pot. That shit's funny even if it defies the laws of physics underwater. Anyways, it then cuts to Plankton making a controllable robot out of Sandy's fur pelt as he commences his operations by ripping off imitation crabs. Yeah, spoiler alert, this episode is pretty much a ripoff of imitation crabs. And to sort of reiterate what I said in the last review, there are a lot of episodes in the series that sort of piggyback on the premises of older episodes. I don't know if it's because they thought putting some slightly different spins on past scenarios would somehow revitalize the series into something better, or if they were a little bit too disoriented from smacking each other over the head with various office supplies repeatedly during writing sessions. The Chum Bucket will always be my favorite restaurant! Sandy, you don't sound like yourself. Mer, mer, mer. Anyway, so Plankton makes his way to the Krusty Krab, smashes the glass door, which actually made me laugh really damn hard the first time I saw it, and slinks his way to the kitchen where he confronts Spongebob and tries to butter him up to reveal the secret formula. Now I must ask, why didn't he just order a Krabby Patty and then analyze it back in his laboratory? Better yet, why doesn't he just hypnotize someone, make them order a Krabby Patty, and bring it back to him? Wait, did they already do an episode like that? They didn't? Well shit, I think I just came up with a somewhat creative idea for an episode. Hey Nickelodeon, I'll accept payment for my contributions in either cash or debit. If cash, I'd like my payments in 20s. Yeah, but this is your old buddy Sandy Cheeks. Why, you and me are as closer in two catfish in skillet. Uh, Sandy, section 9 number 34.44-929B specifically prohibits the disclosure of the secret formula to friends, even when those friends are, quote, Closer in two catfish in a skillet. Okay, not to go off on too much of a tangent here, but I gotta be honest. I think one of the best aspects of the series that's been the most consistent throughout has been most of the voice acting. And Plankton, for one, has always been a personal favorite. I've always loved how animated Doug Lawrence's performances were. And like some of the other cast members, including Roger Bumpus, Bill Fagerbach, and Tom Kenny, of course, as annoying as I've grown to find SpongeBob's laughing and crying, the voice acting has always been really good, in my opinion at least. And I know I sort of shat on Doug in the first part for his involvement with writing for One Course Meal, though the truth is he's always been one of my favorite voice actors and writers for the show. I guess during the time of my review for One Course Meal, I was voicing my disappointment for the way the episode turned out and really the morality surrounding the character's decisions. I never meant any ill intent towards Doug, which I apologize if it ever seemed like I did. I might elaborate on my feelings on said episode in a commentary someday if I ever feel inclined to make one. But anyways, as I mentioned earlier, I got a little bit off 
soundtrack here. I'd have to say that Doug's performance is one of the highlights of this episode, and I can't help but laugh at the exaggerated Texan accent. Anyways, from this point onward, the rest of the episode pretty much cuts back and forth between Spongebob giving every little tedious detail about how to make a Krabby Patty to Plankton as Plankton attempts to follow Spongebob's ridiculous rules on making the perfect sandwich, and Sandy walking through town being laughed at and insulted by the townspeople. Yeah, again, it's not a very eventful episode to be honest, but let's talk about both scenarios and see how long we can flesh this out. So on one hand, the scenario with Plankton and Spongebob is actually really boring compared to the episode it's attempting to rip off. In Imitation Crabs, there are plenty of unusual and out-of-place visual gags that Spongebob and Plankton perform for a secret handshake just so Spongebob can hand over the formula itself. And it works because of how unusual the activities are and how it plays with your expectations. Oh, and by the way, if it wasn't for that episode, we wouldn't have this glorious meme that died out way too soon before its time. Ravioli, ravioli, what's in the pocket only? The problem with the gags in this episode is that they're incredibly dry and predictable. Yeah, the methods of constructing the Krabby Patty are showcased in ridiculous manners, but it feels like it lacks both exaggeration and creativity. Like, there's nothing really clever here besides drying seaweed, really. I'm pretty sure they would have done something really clever with counting sesame seeds, but considering this is modern SpongeBob, that'd probably be the joke itself. Counting sesame seeds. On the other hand, we have Sandy's scenario, which is the main reason why this episode is so despised, and rightfully so. The townspeople start out just laughing and mistaking her for various different species, and as the episode progresses, they start shunning and attacking her, all the while she tries to remain undercover. Not an ounce of it is funny, and they all come off as needlessly cruel. Not to mention, it's almost like Sandy's identity strictly relies on the fact that she wears a spacesuit, rather than the fact that she's a squirrel. A land squirrel at that, as in from above water. I mean, you'd think they would have at least recognized her without her fur. Yeah, it's kind of like getting your hair cut and not being recognized by your classmates or co-workers for a few days, but at least after a second glance they'd be able to tell it's you by your facial features and voice. Unless you get plastic surgery and start smoking copious amounts of cigarettes. I've been smoking for 30 years and I've been trying to quit for 10. <laughs> Hell, I can assume she's been a Bikini Bottom resident for years and they still haven't noticed? God, it's like the townspeople have the brains of... fish. Oh, it all makes sense now. Oh, try again. Oh, try again. Oh, try again. Oh, try again. Is it me or is this trying to rip off Big Pink Loser? So the episode ends after an anticlimactic battle between Sandy and Plankton, where Sandy gets her pelt back and Krabs retains the formula. She gets arrested by the same cops who were making fun of her earlier, this time for public nudity. <laughs> Remember when the police were actually helpful and did their jobs? Which I got a weird feeling that people in the comment section are gonna try and make some kind of a political statement out of that joke. I'm pretty sure being massive hypocritical dicks wasn't in the oaths they swore by, or being inconsistent for that manner. Either way, it's a pretty weak ending, but ultimately, what else can one expect from an episode with an already weak premise? Overall, this episode was boring. Again, it tried taking elements from nostalgic settings to try and make something new out of them, and for the most part, it failed to hold a candle to its predecessors. It only had a few jokes that managed to make me laugh. Pretty much most of the time when Plankton is trying to roll with a Texas accent, and when Krabs is seen dressed up in a French maid outfit. Otherwise, it's a real snore fest. Oh, and that part where Plankton smashed that glass door totally caught me off guard. He just strolled in like, FUCK THIS GLASS SHIT! Although, it's the way that the town treats Sandy as to why I'm including this for review. They're all way too mean-spirited towards her, and she ends up receiving punishment in the end for having her shit stolen. Which, honestly, I don't see why she couldn't have had a spare pelt in the first place if it's detachable, or at least a onesie with minions on it. Pretty sure Walmart has that on sale now. Again, being arrested by the same cops who were making fun of her earlier. If the writers were to try a little bit harder to come up with some original gags, maybe it would have evened it out a little more. And maybe if Sandy's scenario focused less on the town insulting her, her, mistaking her for a naked chipmunk, and had someone empathize with her and actually help her find her fur pelt, maybe it could have worked out a little better. I would say throw in another character to help her like Patrick, but thinking about that, yeah, it probably wouldn't be a good idea. In fact, I would say that it probably would have been more interesting if Plankton's scenario wasn't part of the second half. Like, the only reason his scenario is being showcased in the second half is because Krabs conveniently puts the secret formula out in plain sight, and Plankton keeps trying to snag it while SpongeBob is tedious 
obviously showing him how to make a Krabby Patty. If they were to remove the part where Krabs puts the formula on the counter, I think they would have opened up a plethora of opportunities for Sandy. Maybe just leave it where Plankton was attempting to speak in a Texas drawl and then the rest of the episode focusing on Sandy asking people for clues as to where it might have gone and who might have taken it. Yeah, I realize this might be a lot for an 11 minute episode, but I'm just trying to piece together how this episode could have been better. I can't say her treatment is as bad as some of the Squidward torture porn episodes, but I think it still deserves to be noted and looked at as one. Even though I guess you can say it's a Sandy torture porn, but that just puts a terrible image in my head involving sandpaper and a lot of screaming. Two down, one more to go. Sweet tits. Anyways, this last review is quite possibly the most offensive SpongeBob episode I have ever- God damn it, who's calling me now? Hello? Why hello, dead monkey. A little birdie wearing sunglasses told me that you think my breath stinks. Can you explain, you long-haired piece of garbage? Uh, oh, hey, Skull Ripper. <laughs> I, I don't know what you were that little birdie with sunglasses are talking about. Well, since you're reviewing Spongebob episodes, I was sort of under the notion that what you might have meant was that I was ugly. <laughs> of course I would never say anything bad about you, Skull. Uh, did that little birdie with sunglasses happen to be wearing plaid, too? Aha! Gotcha, caveman! Well, to be honest, Zack, I don't find you ugly. But, considering we live a few states away from each other, I've always imagined you smell like the inside of a rotting alpaca carcass if a moose came over and took a big dump on it. Oh, I see. You just don't want to admit that you're calling me ugly! Don't have the balls to admit it! Well, guess what, boy? I'm gonna make you pay! And I think you know how I'm gonna... Do it, too. You're gonna make me watch the WWE with you and Roundtree? Well, that, and I'm gonna make you review an episode that I know for a fact that you're going to hate. Come on, bro, we can work this out civilly. There's no need to- I remember you once said that this episode made your brain cells simultaneously combust and the copious amounts of arrogant bastard now that followed couldn't kill the images and sounds that engulfed your entire conscious! Wait a second. You aren't talking about- Yes, Monk. I'm talking about that episode. You fetid bastard! I knew you would say that. So typical. But that's what you get for not getting part three out sooner, bitch! Oh, mark my words, Skull Ripper. I swear, on my CD collection, my video game collection, my autographed transcended CD from the Devon Townsend Project, and all of the nutcrackers that were once resting on my fireplace for the past three years consecutively, that you will pay tenfold. I wish you the best of luck on your endeavors, Mr. Monkey. No suffering, you festering fuzznucket! <laughs> Stop giving my internet friends my phone number. <sighs> it's rodeo days! Before I start the review, let me explain something. While I don't find this episode to be morally fucked compared to episodes like Little Yellow Book and One Course Meal, besides a few aspects here and there, I can safely say that this is one of those episodes that, to me, encapsulates a lot of what's wrong with most bad modern Spongebob episodes. That, and I find this episode to be, frankly, annoying. Maybe a little more annoying than what most of the community might think, but of course this is all subjective, right? I mean, there's no real big right or wrong answers here. We're talking about Spongebob. SpongeBob, not video games, politics, or the bandwagon YouTube drama of the week. I originally started this series for the sake of fun, entertainment, and friendly discussion. With that said, we're almost done with part three, so let's put on our big boy pants, or big girl pants depending on what gender you are, or whatever gender the Tumblr aficionados are identifying as this week, and let's get this shit over with. The episode begins with a French narrator attempting to recreate an opening from the earlier seasons. The eternal expanse of the deep sea, teeming with fantastic creatures. Uh, teeming... I'm sure they're around here somewhere. Aha! 
Oh, that's a rock. You know, the French narrator always had some sort of entertaining monologue in the intros of the episodes he's featured in back in the day. I don't know if they were huffing for breeze canisters when they wrote this introduction, but it's like they gave up about halfway through the first sentence. And unfortunately, they gave up for the next few minutes, because pretty much nothing happens. Okay, some stuff happens, but it's so boring. We see SpongeBob and Patrick engaging in a staring contest, and it's about as invigorating as watching your car window defend. Frost. You are the best starer I've ever stared at! Oh, staring contest. I thought it was a blinking contest and I was losing. Hey look, it's Patrick's one tooth that keeps showing itself when he says something stupid or delivers a punchline. Yet another small reoccurring visual gag that was once funny the first few times and becomes mildly irritating after the 20th. Yeah, I'm gonna be more nitpicky about this episode than your doctor when he's picking the little bugs out of that rainforest in your pants. In other words, BITCH YOU GOT CRAMS! So once a mysterious message in a bottle comes hurtling down conveniently into Spongebob's hands, they read it to discover that it's for Sandy and they attempt to deliver it at Sandy's tree dome. And after some more mediocre jokes, this time they don't know how to open a fucking door, Sandy comes out of nowhere and assumes they're trying to put on a ninja sneak attack. Okay, were they also huffing Windex when they wrote this dialogue? So she reads the message and finds out that some big rodeo gig is happening back in Texas to which she must go to defend her title. Which unfortunately segues into one of the most annoying songs in the entire series. Critters that you gotta wrangle. Cowboy suits with purdy spangles. Boots with spurs that jingle jangle. That's a yo. Don't let your kids watch it. Oh my god, where do I even start with this? First of all, you can barely hear any of the instrumentals in the background. Second of all, the lyrics consist of nothing but Texan stereotypes that I'm pretty sure even Hank Hill would find offensive. I like this new generation of music. Tight blue jeans you gotta squeeze in. But they sure look mighty pleasing. Mother of God, it's all toilet sounds. And worst of all, there's these poorly animated cow cutouts singing along and... Oh my god, it's just so damn annoying. The whole segment is mind-numbingly stupid and it kind of comes out of nowhere. And again, I know I'm being very nitpicky about this, but for some reason, this whole segment makes me cringe hardcore. It's like the audio embodiment of passing a kidney stone. I mean, at least I want to go home, kept the stereotypes to a minimum, and wasn't annoying and try-hardy. Because it seems like the song is trying really hard to keep your attention. Kind of like a fat kid yelling at his mom to look at him jump off of the high dive at their local swimming pool. Pretty much me when I took swimming lessons as a kid. And it really shows how badly your character's been flanderized. Oh, did I forget to mention? Her character's been flanderized to shit, just like the other characters. But I'm pretty sure you all knew that by now. And for those who don't, all the main characters' personalities have been limited to around two to three main interests each. And those interests pretty much make up their whole personality. And in Sandy's case, her character is now completely defined by science, karate, and being from Texas. Granted, she along with the other characters were always sort of one-dimensional with their personalities, though their identities didn't completely rely on these gimmicks. They were interesting, cunning, and had some level of self-control and intelligence. And yeah, I think it's safe to say that Sandy is still arguably the most intelligent character in the show, though her personality has been flanderized just as much, if not more, than her comrades. Also, I probably didn't mention this earlier in the intro, but Sandy wasn't this interested in science in the early your seasons from what I remember. In fact, the whole underwater explorer thing wasn't even focused on that much besides a few episodes here and there, but I remember her being more obsessed with karate and extreme sports than her scientific work. And it wasn't until later when her profession as an inventor was officially revealed in the episode Chimps Ahoy, which I can definitely give my praise to the writers for giving her an update of sorts and putting more emphasis on her scientific interests and giving her an official occupation, though I simultaneously criticized them for making her scientific obsession the center point of her personality itself. But I digress. Once Sandy mentions the rodeo clown, SpongeBob freaks out and tries to urge her not to go. But her diving suit turns into a rocket and she shoots off to the surface. Wait, let me get this straight. She's a talking squirrel scientist, marine biologist, inventor, clam wrestler, psychologist, and voyeurist whose deep sea diving suit and spacesuit triples as a rocket. <sighs> I'm gonna lose my shit by 
by the end of this, I swear. And amazingly, this is all that happens in the first half of the episode. And the rest of the episode consists of SpongeBob going around town, asking the other characters to help him go after Sandy. They go after Sandy, they find Sandy, and then it ends. And yeah, I know, I just spoiled the entire thing for you, but seriously, what did you expect? But like the last review, I'll humor you all and I'll keep on chugging. So as SpongeBob goes around and tries to ask the characters for help, surprisingly, they all come up with some weird excuses and they don't help him. And some of them don't even remember her name and they can't even properly describe her physical attributes. Despite the fact that, again, she's been a resident of Bikini Bottom since the third fucking episode. And miraculously, the only scene that was remotely funny to me throughout the second half was Squidward's scene. Because who else but Squidward? He's Squidward! Squidward! You never really know what you gonna do that day, Squidward! Squidward! Fuck you all, I'm gonna go play my clarinet! <laughs> Anyways, when it comes to Mr. Krabs, he literally states that he only cares if it involves monetary gain. But then again, considering some of the shady shit that I've seen him do in the first part and a few other episodes outside of it, I'm not surprised that he's become that one-dimensional. And when SpongeBob confronts Plankton, he apparently joined ISIS or something. Hello, Ikebon! Hello, Ikebon! Hello, Ikebon! <laughs> Even Gary doesn't give a shit about her and doesn't even know who she is. And you know shit's serious when the fucking snail has bad memory. Like, remember when Sandy united the town together in search parties when SpongeBob went missing to try and find him? Even though Sandy went completely overboard and didn't think of the children. Or when the town banded together to form one of the greatest marching bands in television history for Squidward? <laughs> Banded. <laughs> Ban humor. But anyways, these people used to care about their fellow citizens, and now it's like they only care about themselves. I mean, they're all so... selfish. <laughs> Get it? Selfish. <laughs> oh god, I crack myself up sometimes. Shut up, you loser! Ah, come and say that to my face, you bastard! <laughs> So SpongeBob concocts this brilliant plan by blowing bubbles and having them telepathically float into the houses of his friends and the townspeople and kidnaps them. Which is funny because right before he tries to take Gary with him, he declares that he's gonna search for her on his own. Almost as if there was a small implication that SpongeBob was gonna search for her by himself. As if maybe the writers possibly scrapped the idea in the middle of writing. Yeah, I think the second half probably would have been more interesting if SpongeBob were to have gone on a little journey to search for her himself. Hell, maybe have Patrick tag along to make some condescending insults and they'd stumble into an underwater geyser and then blast them to Texas. I mean, that may be a somewhat contrived idea for an alternative scenario, but hopefully not as contrived as kidnapping all the residents of the city with sentient bubbles and then magically floating to the rodeo stadium. If anything, he's putting his entire city at risk of suffocating once they hit the surface and the bubble pops. Did you even think of that, SpongeBob? You're about to commit a mass genocide on your own people, piece of shit. So they make it to the surface, yada yada yada, they find themselves in Texas. Texas, herp de derp merp. Sandy is riding on a bullfrog and falls off. Blah buddy blah blah fucking blah. SpongeBob gets in trouble. Sandy saves them, and the episode just ends. Just like I said earlier, it just ends. That's it. Review done. I'm done. Good night, folks. Ah, shit. I gotta finish this, don't I? Well, I do have a few things to say to wrap things up here. I feel like lazy is the perfect way to describe this episode in one word. And part of me wonders how much effort should I really exert in describing and criticizing the last three minutes when there hasn't been a lot of creative effort being thrown in this episode in the first place. In the first half, there's really not that much going on, and when there's an attempt at a joke, it's usually half-assed and surrounded by slow, boring filler. And in the other half, even the characters themselves don't seem to give a shit about what's going on in the plot, and the supposed protagonist has to kidnap the townspeople in order to aid his own cause when he probably was much better off just going alone in the first place. Not to mention the ending is anticlimactic and the use of cheap flash animation with stock photos doesn't really add any comedic effect whatsoever. And said flash animation only makes me wish that Jib Jab would make more animation videos instead of cheap e-cards. Sorry to go a little off topic here, but if there was any political season that needed a presidential Jib Jab parody video, it was this one. Golden opportunity missed. Again, the episode seems like it was lazily 
put together. And in a lot of ways, that's another one of the show's biggest problems. It isn't just the fact that there are so many minutes wasted in a good chunk of these bad episodes where the characters do virtually nothing and stall for the sake of making the mandatory 11 minute running time, or the bland, tedious jokes they throw in without any real creativity behind them, or even the occasional god-awful song. It's the subjective opinion that there isn't much effort that's being put into the show when you compare it to past episodes. And one more important thing that I feel really drags the show down nowadays is the dialogue. Why the dialogue in particular? Let me explain. One of the things that I love about the older episodes, especially in seasons 2 and 3, is how the dialogue was constructed between the characters. The vocabulary used was fairly extensive, and when I was younger, I didn't fully understand the context of what they were saying a certain chunk of the time. Lines like the inner machinations of my mind are an enigma puzzled the absolute fuck out of my mind when I was a kid, and when I grew up and my vocabulary extended, it was all the more satisfying understanding what those words meant. And for those who need a translation, it basically means my mind works in mysterious ways. Then again, you probably could have done a Google search on that. The way the writers constructed these kind of phrases using more articulate words made the show more accessible for an adult audience, and I can assume that they thought that kids would later pick up on these timeless quotes when they would get older. The show has become so memorable partially because of the kind of quirky yet intelligent quotations that were sprinkled in there. Like, I'm sorry for binging on member berries here, but I sort of wish some of these current writers could grasp this concept. Remember when SpongeBob was good? Oh, I, I remember. remember. I remember when Patrick was in a dickhead? Oh, yes. I remember. I remember. Oh, yeah. I remember. Oh, yeah. I remember. Remember when Dead Monkey wanted to waste our time with these shitty jokes? Oh, yeah. I remember. Oh, yes. I remember. I remember. Now it's like they're only trying to appeal to younger kids, but not in the same way. From what I see, and please bear with me when I say this, but it's like they're intentionally simplifying the dialogue only to try to appeal to a younger audience. Which I'm not saying that trying to appeal to a younger demographic is necessarily a bad thing here. From a creative and business standpoint, they can try to appeal to whatever demographic they want. And maybe all this is just my inner man-child whining about this, wishing they would try to appeal to me and my generation. Though honestly, I wish they they would, dare I say, think about the children they're marketing to. I think if they really wanted to put in the effort to keep the same integrity that the original show had, they should consider some of the strategies that some of the writers from both season 2 and 3 took. Implementing their own instances of intelligent dialogue, and maintaining the character's somewhat multi-layered personality so that kids from the current generation can pick up on these subtleties later down the line. Making it so that those small moments can add up and leave a similarly positive impact on said generation. I guess this is my little message to the current writers of the show for future references, but hey, what do I know? I just wasted about 50 minutes of my life complaining about a cartoon, and I still have three more parts left. Well, to end Sandy's part, the only thing I can say about her is, while she's probably seen a little more positive change than the others, I would say that her biggest problem is that her character has been flanderized to the point where she seems to care more about her personal interests than her friends, and has virtually become just as one-dimensional as the other characters. That's that's about it, really. And as for this episode, it's just annoying. And I'd find more entertainment out of popping my ass pimples than watching this again. Good riddance. So that's the end of part three. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for waiting. If you like what you saw, feel free to like, comment, share, subscribe, and do all that good stuff. Because God knows I need more attention. And since I pretty much laid out all the parts down below in the comments section of the past couple of videos and in this video too, the next one, I'm going to be tackling not just one character, but three characters. Boy, that should be interesting. So this is Dead Monkey signing out. Take it easy and have a good one. And if you'll excuse me now, I gotta go take a wicked piss. <sighs> one year of non-stop sleep and I feel like I just pissed out my left kidney. Oh God. <sighs> Ah! What the hell are you doing here? I bet you didn't expect to see me here now, did ya? Well, if I knew, then I wouldn't have asked. So make it like Slipknot and spit it out, bro. Okay, that was a good one. Uh, but anyways, 
Now that you finished with part three, it's time for you to get started on part four. What? I have so many other projects I need to work on. I can't just- As my whipping boy, I demand you to make part four at once! Oh, seriously, man, you know that I have things that I'd much rather be doing right now. You're talking to me as if I've given you a choice in the matter. Excuse me? I refuse to wait another year. Your audience refuses to wait another year. From now on, you are going to be much more consistent with your uploads. Got it, Monk? Well, don't just stand there. Get your ass a crack of lichen! We can do this the easy way, or the hard way, or the semi-medium easy but hard- No! What?! I have a better idea. Well, what could that possibly be? I'm going to kill you! Do I get a say in the matter? No, you don't! <laughs> yeah! Harpins, boys, because we got ourselves a new specimen, the Land Whale. This specimen does have a name, the name is Chloe. We money from the one percent of the one percent. No more lives matter. No more lives matter. We money from the one percent. Just for taxes for everyone. Yes, minimum wage is ten dollars. Ah. All this hard work sawing up a corpse sure does pay off with a mango, strawberry, cranberry juice smoothie. When in doubt, pinky out. Mmm, mmm, mmm. That's some good stuff. Now to get rid of the remains. Big boy, Stouty. <laughs> Try and make the next episode of the Great American Buys now, Stout. <laughs> <laughs> What the hell is that thing? You had disgraced the great stout worm! What have you done with Daddy? 